<laughs> thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you very much to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this wonderful conference here in gloomy <laughs> Germany right now. Uh, no, it's been great fun. Um, so it, if you look in the abstract book, I changed my title. Uh, what I wrote in the abstract will still show up in this talk. But before we do that, I thought I'd point out that unlike a majority of the audience here, I am, uh, at, at heart, I'm a materials chemist. And so I'm always interested in, well, what are we going to do with materials? What materials needs are there, right? So we want to solve some problem. Could be scientific, could be societal, could be many things. What I'm interested in is what materials properties do you need to, do, need to have that we don't currently have that will let us do that? And then you enter this now sort of kind of famous loop where you basically make things and characterize them, develop models, use that to predict new ones, at least if the models are any good, they've got predictive power. And you do this many times and, you know, if you're lucky you get useful devices out. Um, but also you have this opportunity down here that you discover new things. You know, what's the opposite of Eureka? Um, things you didn't expect. And, um, now sort of focusing more on the physics, here's the way I think about energy scales in physics. Um, I've shamelessly adapted this from Takura, uh, where I basically added a, a third dimension to it. But basically you have sort of four, you have an electron-electron interaction, you've got some bandwidth, which describes something about the hopping, you've got a disorder potential, and you've got some coupling to phonons, and you've got some spin orbit coupling. And depending on, and if you, you know, so if you make the electron electron repulsion really, really big, then the electrons localize themselves and you get some kind of mod insulator. Charge density wave if you have strong coupling to the lattice. Anderson insulator if you have a large disorder potential. And, you know, the, the thing that was added, you know, I guess a decade ago now, at least in 3D, is this axis up here where when you, that you end up with topological band insulators. Um, now, before I actually tell you about the science today, I have to actually acknowledge the people who do the work these days, um, which, which is my group, uh, the people who pay for it, and I have the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with people from around the world on this, uh, on much of our science. So, um, one thing that's often um, overlooked or sort of stuffed in the, on the wayside, but is actually critically important in this business, is the ability to be able to produce very well-defined crystals of these interesting materials. And we happen to be very fortunate to have Dr. Syed Kupaya on our, at our Institute for Quantum Matter, who is an expert in the floating zone crystal growth, and not all of these, but many of these are actually crystal growths that he developed. And I'm going to tell you actually about a couple of them, including this one with samarium hexaborn. <sighs> okay, uh, one more thing I have to advertise, which is the National Science Foundation uh, created these new materials innovation platforms this year. Um, and I happen to be the pleasure of being part of this one, Platform for the Accelerated Realization, Analysis, and Discovery of Interface Materials, Paradigm, although you notice we can't spell, there's no G. Um, but the idea, no, no, so at the high level, the science idea um, it, it, it is a very neat one, I think. The idea is, so substrates have been used to modulate the properties of thin films for a long time, right? And usually this is thought of in the context of some kind of stress or strain on the film, right? In epitaxial films. But you can do more than that, at least in theory, right? What if you have a substrate like this one, which is copper oxyselenate, which actually hosts a skirmion lattice. What if you can couple some of the magnetic or electronic degrees of freedom in your substrate to modulate the properties of the thin film that you grew on top. That's the idea. In fact, so single layer FESE on strontium titanate, which is roughly a 100 Kelvin superconductor, may be an example of this. But the point of this platform is you know, more than just that, that particular system. The idea is to go far beyond that. Okay? Um, but it's not just a science, uh, scientific center. Um, we're also building up a, quite an array of unique capabilities that are actually available to you guys via proposals. So we get lots of money for new equipment, and this is what we need to do because of it. So we encur I encourage you to check out how to do that. We are actually open for proposals, although a lot of the equipment is coming over the next year to year and a half. Um, and it includes things like several hundred atmosphere floating zone crystal growths. Um, to do that, you know, here are single crystals of sapphire with holes drilled in them. 
uh, that form the chamber, the active chamber for that particular technique. The B ability to do MBE, CVD, and RPES all without breaking vacuum, all this kind of stuff. You know, this is all be available. And the ability to do cryo S stem measurements at very low temperatures, which, okay. So, the bulk crystal part of this facility is what's located at Johns Hopkins University, and it's what I'm in charge of. And international and industrial partnerships are welcome. So if some of the things you saw me flash by you are of interest to you, please come talk to me. Okay? We can talk. All right. So now, now I can actually tell you about what I do. <laughs> and I'm a materials chemist, and I have a broad array of research interests, so I do a lot of things. So here's an example of a few things we've done in recent years. So in the area of frustrated magnets, uh, one thing we've done is pioneer this idea that instead of using individual magnetic ions as the magne basic magnetic building block for some of these frustrated materials, that we can actually use small clusters, such as in this case, small MO3 clusters, where the electron count is such that there's one unpaired electron spread out across the cluster. That then forms, a, it's like a big atom, essentially, but it's a spin and a half unit, and then you can arrange them on lattices like triangular lattices and, and systematically control and design geometrically frustrated magnetic materials. Okay? More recently, we've taken this canonical uh, Kagame and spin liquid candidate material called Herbert Smithite, and we've been able to successfully introduce electrons into this material. The chemistry here, this actually took two years to develop the chemistry on how to do that, but we were able to do it. And you know, the sample changes color and all this kind of stuff, but it never actually t turns into a metal or a superconductor or anything like that. It actually just stays an insulator. Presumably, our, our going hypothesis for why is these are very narrow band systems, so any disorder potential, even if it's reasonably small, still is enough to keep the carriers localized. Okay? Could be something more exotic, but that seems the most likely. Here's an interesting one. So this, these are KFE2SE3 and BAFE2SE3. These are one-dimensional analogs of the iron superconductors. And what do you gain by reducing the dimensionality? Well, you get rid of some of the degrees of freedom, and it lets you actually study some of the underlying physics without having to worry about them going superconducting, for example. In fact, these things stay insulating the whole time, because they really are like two by infinity slices out of the, out of the iron calcogenide lattice. Okay, but here's something interesting that we figured out in these materials is that, you know, here you've got all the sort of d orbitals on the iron that are playing together. But one interesting result that comes out of this is that some of those electrons form magnetic order, but other electrons don't. They actually form bonds between iron atoms, right? And this actually makes sense. It, it's basically a statement that you have five d orbitals and they have radically different bandwidths based on how much they interact between sites. And so some of the, for some of those, the Hubbard U is enough to open up a simple gap and localize the carriers and make magnetic order. And in other cases, not. And since they're one-dimensional materials, presumably, well, you, we see it, you get uh, perils like distortions where you distort the lattice and form bonds. Okay? Uh, more recently is making honeycomb Iridates, and in particular trying to put carriers in those. We haven't actually successfully put a fractional number of carriers in one of those yet, although we're hard, hard at work on that. Um, but enough of the advertising on to what this workshop is all about. Um, so we've heard a lot, so topological insulators, then you've learned something about Dirac semimetals and vial semimetals. And my talk today is actually going to focus on systems where there are actually sizable interactions. Okay, that's, those are the materials that I'm going to talk about today. Now, given my chemistry background, one thing I'm, you know, w was amused to do when I showed up at Johns Hopkins is my colleague David Yarconi is famous in physical chemistry for coming up or for figuring out so-called conical intersections and their impact on spectroscopy of molecules. So what actually happened, so what this plot is, is this is a plot of the nitrogen-oxygen bond length in this molecule, hydroxyamine, as a function of energy. So this is the ground state 
multi-electron wave function. This is the first excited state, the second excited state, so on and so forth. But because of the symmetry requirements out here when the, when it, the molecule's fragmented into two components, compared to when it's uh, formed a molecule over here, you get this crossing. So basically, you know, this potential would have done this, and this potential would have done, or sorry, this potential would have, yeah. Then this potential would have done that, but because they overlap, you then get this conical intersection. And indeed, if you do a loop around this and integrate it, you get a berry phase of pi, right? So this is this is quite literally the molecular version of topology. And it turns out that these so, these so-called conical intersections are exceedingly important in understanding how most molecules react to light. If they're not there, you typically get the wrong. If you don't include them, you typically get the wrong answer. So they're very, very important. And one thing I would be excited to see this field do is to more explicitly consider how the nuclear degrees of freedom, that is to say the phonons, can do similar things to what we're now used to with the electronic degrees of freedom. Okay? So there we go. That's my spiel on where I think we should go. So. SMB6, so samarium hexaboride is a cubic material with the following structure. It's got samarium on the corners and, a, and an octahedra of boron in the center. And it's been known for a very, very long time. This is data from Ted Gabal, Stanford from 60 years ago now. Um, where, and, he, and this is resistivity versus temperature. Okay? And it has the f two following interests. So it, it starts to turn up, sort of like the semiconductor might. And then, you know, this is the data and then the solid lines are some model he came up with. You start to see a plateau, right? So the resistance doesn't continue to diverge, it tends to plateau. Here's more recent data with the more complex measurement geometry that really shows that in some of these samples you really do get a plateau, right? So what's the origin of that plateau? So in the old days, which is to say in the 70s, the answer was, well, something's going on, you get, Defects, surface crud, all this kind of stuff, right? It's the usual thing. And as evidence for that, here's some very old um, backscatter electron diffraction data showing a pristine surface and then some kind of reconstruction that happens very, very rapidly. So this is lanthanum hexaboride, pristine surface. This is samarium hexaboride. There's some additional periodicity here that you can see, some tripling of the thing. And so the old explanation is just you're, you have something going on that shorts the system out and you're done. You can actually do, you can actually see visually that. So this is a flux grown crystal of samarium hexaboride with X-ray computed tomography. So it's a CT scan. Um, and the contrast is adjusted to show light Z inclusions, right? And you can see very, very nicely that in fact there were these plates in here. They turn out to be the aluminum flux that was used to grow this crystal. And one of the amazing things about this is that these crystals are not randomly oriented. There's an alignment of the crystal orientation between those crystals, between these crystal planes and the samarium hexaboride crystal planes. This is not surprising. They're both cubic. Their lattice parameters are less than a percent apart. Um, so that's the old explanation. The new explanation is it's topological, and that this is, in fact, surface states. That the reason this shorts out is because these are the surface states. And so, you know, here's a, from a toy theoretical model showing as a function of the effective valence of this ion what you do. So you turn from a normal band insulator into a strong topological insulator, and if you then distort it tetragonally, you still have topological insulating states over some region of this phase diagram. And for samarium, uh, if you use, for example, X-ray spectroscopy and ask, well, what's the valence of samarium, you get a value of about two and a half, which would put it close to this line and maybe on that side, but maybe on that side, okay? That's the new explanation. Well, what is it? So I am now summarizing effectively two years of work by Syed and one of my other uh, former postdocs, Adam. Uh, so when you make materials, of course, they're never perfect. Here's the little reason why. If you use it at low temperatures, kinetics come into play. Basically, the atoms don't have time or they don't have the energy to get into the right position. So you get a large defect concentration. 
On the other hand, at high temperatures, entropy wins, right? And so that T delta S term really wins, and so you get a large number of defects at high temperatures. And so actually, you know, the name of the game in, in much of this chemistry is to control the defects, control the type and number of defects, and see what happens as you systematically vary them, okay? And in this material, we can actually do that. We can put holes in the system via samarium vacancies, fractions of a percent, and we can put electrons in by doping carbon for boron, again, at a very low level. So one here is the same in both of these, just to orient you. And basically, what we find is as you put holes in, this plateau that you see at low temperatures goes away. Whereas when you put electrons in, <coughs> that plateau actually becomes more robust. And if you then do a thickness dependence of samarium hexaboride, where you basically take the sample, thin it, measure it again, take the sample, thin it, and measure it again, you find that, you know, in, this, in most of this part of the curve, it, if you then compute the resistivity, you get the same number. But then at the below something about 10 Kelvin, uh, you don't get the same number. In other words, that, that low temperature value is thickness dependent. And in fact, then the resistivity. But what that really means is that it's not dependent on the bulk anymore, but instead scales with some other dimension, which in this case is the surface. Okay, so at least if you believe that's proof of surface states um, in transport, uh, then that's what you see. But the point is, if you, but the trend here is really nice. We can systematically vary that by adjusting the defect concentration in this material. And so we came up with this toy model that basically you have your bulk material with a bulk band gap, and then you have some surface states that are sort of weighted towards the, what would be the conduction band. And as you tune across here, you can basically populate those surface states or not. Okay? And so this is great, this is wonderful, but is it really a topological insulator? Because none of this actually tells you that, right? And uh, that's actually exceedingly hard to figure out in this material, in part because the band gap is very, very small. And because the band gap is very, very small, it's very, very difficult to do ARPES, for example, with sufficient energy resolution to get conclusive data. So here's, here's how that problem was tackled. So here are the eight time reversal invariant momenta in a cubic Brillouin zone. Okay, you've got one gamma, three X's, three M's, and an R. Um, and it's the product of the occupied states of the parodies <laughs> at, at these eight points that actually tell you the topological, uh, whether it's topological or not. And so now here is some single crystal neutron scattering data. So inelastic neutron scattering, you're measuring the energy transfer to the sample with neutrons, right? So it's an inelastic scattering measurement. Um, on a doubly isotoped enriched single crystal, because both of these natively absorb, so it's samarium-154, boron-11. Um, and what you see is a beautiful subgap, because so, the excitation, in, this is a cut in reciprocal space at this energy range that's, you know, centered at 14 MeV, and that's below this sort of band gap, right? The charge gap in this material. So this is a subgap spin exciton, and what, you, what I want you to see is that it has a pattern in momentum space. Right? And in particular, that it seems to have a whole lot of intensity here and not much there, right? Or it's got, a whole, it's got basically nothing at M and it has some at X and R. Okay? So just from these intensities and the fact that this actually has a, a magnetic form factor, so this is actually a magnetic excitation of some kind, we know that actually the parity changes between X and M. We don't know which one's which parity, but we know that the parity changes between X and M. And that only leaves us with four possibilities, given the high cubic symmetry of this material. So here are the four possibilities. Two of them are it's a strong topological insulator. One of them it's a so-called weak topological insulator, which is to say in 3D, the product is one and it would be trivial. But if I take a surface, like this surface, then you've got a one in this surface, which is a three, so that so the, the two-dimensional surfaces there are, can be topological, and only one case where it's not a topological. So this is almost the proof. And then actually if you try to compute 
neutron scattering intensities, and this is one of the beauties of neutron experiments like this, is we have a pretty good handle on the scattering theory and can actually do quantitative comparisons to the data. This scattering, this particular pattern of intensity, in particular strongest here, weaker here, and none there, um, is beautifully reproduced if you take this band structure of samarium hexaboride, which has F states crossing the D levels, and from this, now that you have a model of the band structure that fits this data, you learn that indeed it is the as predicted strong topological insulator. So, samarium hexaboride, it's a strong topological, 3D topological insulator. It is. This is a bulk measurement of the bulk of the parity things in the bulk. So, so it is. That's what it is. This does not tell us whether this transport measurement actually comes from topological surface states or not. That's a separate question. But I think that's actually very nice. And this is very, very nice. And in fact, I would point out that the low temperature resist, the actual, you know, if you just take a millimeter sized piece of this material, the absolute resistance can be upwards of a kilo ohm, which means you must be suppressing the bulk conductivity to a pretty good degree. Okay. When I entered this field, I didn't think this was going to be the answer, but the, the data is. <laughs> So in the last uh, few minutes I have, I guess I'll only talk about the second of my few things, which is superconductors with Dirac states. And this project was actually started uh, five years ago now. And as we saw at the beginning of uh, in, some, in many of the nice talks here, this field has moved at an incredible rate. And it's a rate where, it, it, um, but here was the, here was the idea. Well, the, I, the question was, can you find systems where you, do, you, do, you have something interesting with surface states or topology, but you're also a superconductor? And I said, well, and that you have a low carrier density, so you're close to being a semiconductor, right? And maybe can define something with the topology. That was the, and so, the, and so rather than say, well, what are topological insulators and how do I dope them to make them a superconductor? I said, well, let's go the other way. Let's dig out an old table. This is a famous review from Roberts. And he has a whole table that says properties of semiconductive superconductive materials. Or put another way, he has a table of low carrier density superconductors. OK. And so you scan down the list and you say, well, which things have heavy elements? OK. And for a reason I'll show you in just a minute, we ended up settling on this compound, thallium-5, tellurium-3. Um, I wouldn't read too much into the specific numbers here other than to say, you know, that was the idea. It's got heavy elements, so there's going to be a lot of spin-orbit coupling. So, and it's a reported superconductor with a low carrier density, so maybe we can do something with it. So, what is it? Uh, well, here's the way a chemist would write this compound, which is TL4TLTE3. It's actually a perovskite, so it's just like CaTiO3. But instead of the cal, you know, instead of the A, the A cation is actually this TL4 tetrahedron. And then you've got a TL TE3 framework. And we were kind of excited to see this. This was the reason we selected this material. Because the thallium, if you do the naive electron counting in this material, this thallium, the one that sits in the perovskite framework, is it would be thallium in the 2 plus oxidation state. And as Leslie showed in her very nice talk earlier, you know, this really doesn't want to be thallium 2 plus. It would much rather charge disproportionate into thallium 1 plus and thallium 3 plus. You can think of that as a negative U. That's the value. It's got a strong tendency to disproportionation. But I have to say, as of today, we have not found any actual sign <laughs> of any charge disproportionation in this material, either by diffraction techniques or by local structure techniques, where you look at things, non-periodic distortions of the material. OK, so there you go. We found that indeed it is a superconductor. We can grow, this is a half centimeter crystal, but we can grow big crystals of this material. And we can do it in a way that doesn't kill my students, um, which is very important. And no, no, no. And so here's sort of a proper characterization of its superconducting properties. So, it has a tetragonal crystal structure, and so there are two unique crystallographic directions in this material. And if you apply the magnetic field along the c-axis versus apply the magnetic field in plane. And this is the low magnetic field behavior, and then this is HC2 data. And this 
has disturbed us for a long time and I still can't fully explain it, so if you have an idea, please talk to me about it. But here's essentially the problem. So the HC2s in, are basically the same independent of crystal direction and they match the powder very, very well. Okay? On the other hand, if you look at the low magnetization data, you would say that where it starts to deviate from perfect Meissner shielding varies between the two crystal directions. And I have a problem with that because there's something called the thermodynamic critical field in a superconductor, which is essentially the geometric average of HC1 and HC2. And in a tetragonal material like this, the, G the HC1 and HC2 can vary with crystal direction, but their geometric average needs to stay the same because it needs to be able to match what you see in a bulk specific heat measurement. And that's not the case here, and I don't have a good explanation for that. Uh, things like demagnetization and all the sort of the usual sort of extrinsic sources of this, we checked, you know, we made little spheres of this and this kind of thing. So um, there we go. Now, ARPEZ on this material. ARPEZ is hard, and it's hard on this material because it is a perovskite. <laughs> so it's not. Some, it is not evilly, easily cleaved, and it's got enough thallium in it that many of my collaborators aren't happy with trying to cleave 80 samples. So um, this is the best ARPES data we have on this material, and I will be the first to acknowledge that it's not great, but it, but it gets us something. So this is measured on the 001 surface. So this is measured um, on a surface that's perpendicular to 001. Um, and just and so you can take the set. This is the data. You can take the second derivative to sort of highlight the, the the edges, so to speak. And you see something that looks kind of promising, because you see on the one hand you see something down here that's assuredly something bulk and it's got some splitting of some kind, and then you start to see this this very attractive thing peeking up out. And while this stuff down here seems to vary with incident photon momentum, which is to say KZ, um, which is part of why we think it's bulk, uh, this part does not, which is suggestive of it being on the surface. So um, we were able to make it more cleavable by replacing some of the thallium with tin, and then you can actually do a more systematic study, so here it is. And you can take for each of these cuts, you can, for, so for each of these energies, many of which I didn't show, you can you can extract those things and you can plot them on top of each other and decide that there is some feature here that has no KZ dependence. Which given this material, given the tetragonal structure of this material, um, this is likely a surface state. And further, it doesn't seem to have any appreciable, for example, Rashba spin orbit splitting, right? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have bifurcated into two spots, so it may be some kind of topologically protected state. Okay? Now, the one pr thing with this story that we're trying to, to resolve is it's actually, we have not been able to find a way to dope this material to actually get up to whatever this, the top of this would look like. Okay? Which would be sort of much more definitive proof. But we're getting there. Um, so you can actually do the study as a function of tin content. Um, and here's our proposal that you go from something that's almost a metal, I mean the carrier density is pretty high, uh, and you have superconductivity, and now, and then we think, we're pretty sure that the full tin dote version of this can't be a topological insulator, because if you do a, D, a DFT calculation of it, you find that there is a band inversion, but it's between states of the same parity. On the other hand, this material's crystal structure is nominally I4 over MCM, it's got lots of mirror planes and all kinds of things in it, and on the 001 plane, uh, there's plenty of things to protect such a state. Okay? Um, so there you go. So I'm out of time, basically, right? Just, just about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so let me just give the two-minute version of this. So uh, here's another family of iridium compound we've been working on, IR2 SN3 SE3. It's, it's actually a scuderudite type material. Um, with, with, a with a trigonal distortion in it. And if you actually just do basic transport measurements, it looks like germanium doped at the level of 2 times 10 to the 19th carriers. <laughs> it's, 
It's, so it's got, it's got a hideous formula. It's got a pretty crazy structure. And the transport data, again, you can pretty much overlay it on germanium doped at 2 times 10 to the 19th. Uh, and we were kind of curious why that is. Um, it's got some magnetoresistance that we can't saturate with a 9 Tesla field. Um, so you do band structure calculations on this material, and here's what we learn. So this is the material with the lattice parameters as determined experimentally. Despite the very complicated structure, the band structure actually ends up with a single beautiful band, valence band here, poking out towards the Fermi level. And so in fact, this is a p-type material, so it's the carrier density of poles of 2 times 10 to the 19th. And this is why. It's because even though it's got a complicated intrinsic structure, the result is actually a very simple band that looks pretty much like a simple semiconductor. And so that's why it behaves that way. Um, but then here's where we got excited, which is if you apply some tensile strain to this, oh, so if you take this and now you apply, if you shrink the lattice parameter a little bit, which is sort of a standard thing to do, the band gap actually gets bigger by calculations, which is the opposite of what it should do. And so what that's really telling you is that you've probably already gone past some kind of band inversion point, right? And so, in fact, when you strain this a little bit, you can invert iridium D states and selenium P states that, uh, that have opposite parity and get some kind of topological material. So, if you can make this admittedly complicated material in a thin film form uh, with the right amount of strain, you can actually do some topological things with it. Okay? And so, with that, I'll just end there and say thank you very much. And again, thanks for the invitation.